Welcome to Digital Asset News, the top stories in crypto current digital assets and break them down to bite-sized pieces. Today, it's all about votes, V-O-A-T-Z dot com. It's about how blockchain voting is absolutely here. It's going to fix fraud, excessive waiting, and transparency in the election process. So this isn't something you can invest in. This isn't something to make a bunch of money off of, but it's one of those projects that is going to change the world. I got a chance to sit down with the CEO, Nimit Swani, and he told me all about how how this is going to work, how it's going to affect everyday people in the future, and what the progress already is. They've already been a part of 70 different elections, but that's not the problem. Their problem is the amount of people, politicians, and the FUD that is being spread about this project. This is quite a long interview, so we're going to go over just the basics today before we jump in with Nimit. So let's get going. So let's take a look at the market, shall we? It is uh, October 29th, it's 1.45 p.m. I just interviewed Nimit around 10 o'clock, so I need to get this out. So what is happening in our market? Well, Bitcoin, as predicted, took a little bit of a tumble. Uh, actually, I think it was below 13,000 for a little bit. Now it's above, uh, it's around 13.5, up 2.5% in 24 hours or 5.6 for a seven day. People are talking about if Bitcoin can just get above 14,000, there will be no resistance when we go to 20,000. Well, <laughs> that's not how it works. So Ethereum down to 390, but hey, it's almost a 400, so I'm pretty happy with that. Tether's hitting at a 16 billion market cap. XRP still pretty stable around 25. Bitcoin cash down, uh, Binance coin, Chainlink, everything's down. Let's just say everything's down. That's just what the truth. Crypto.com is up. Congratulations. Um, OKB is up a little bit. Who cares? Dai, Nem. Uh, Ethereum, cl Ethereum Classic. Ethereum Classic with their multiple 51% attacks. Amazing. And Celsius Network, of course, they're up. When I really want to get into it uh, as heavy as possible, that's when it goes. But that's just my luck. Remember, dollar cost average, everything should work out. Uh, UMA up 5.7. Uh, so, yeah, about the right. Yearn down to uh, 12%. Before we get into the interview with Nimit, let me just go over the big stories in a very, very, very condensed version. So this was crazy. Uh, Michael Saylor, the CEO of MicroStrategy, he personally owns $240 million in Bitcoin. That's a lot of Bitcoin. Not just uh, part of his subsidiary or another company. Him. He owns a quarter of a billion dollars worth of Bitcoin. I mean, I thought that his uh, company buying $430 million was a ton, but I guess that's not the big story. The big story is this guy really likes Bitcoin and really believes in it. So hats off to that guy. Michael, congratulations. Also, Binance is in trouble. Well, that's a bummer. There was a document called the Tai Chi document. It reveals uh, Binance's elaborate elaborate scheme to avoid the regulators. So real quick, what's happening here is that there's two Binances. There's Binance Global, essentially, and there's Binance US. And they, they made Binance US to pretty much appease the regulators. Well, there's a Tai Chi document, and this was out in like 2018, which a slideshow uh, believed to have been seen by senior Binance execs is a strategic plan to execute a bait and switch. While the then unnamed entity set up operations in the U.S. to distract regulators with feigned interest and compliance. Measures will be put in place to move revenue in the form of licensing fees and more to the parent company Binance, I guess Binance U.S., into Binance. All the while, potential customers would be taught how to evade geographic restrictions while technological workarounds were put in place. So it uh, looks like somebody got their hand caught in the cookie jar. We'll see how that all plays out. They asked for a response, and of course, Binance is like, we're not answering that. So we'll see how it all goes, but uh, not a good day for Binance. And also in the biggest news of potentially the whole day, or maybe the whole week, uh, Avante unanimously wins a Bitcoin banking charter. This is Caitlin Long. She's an ex-Morgan Stanley exec. She's a really smart lady. She's been into uh, finance for you know her entire career. And she is the second special depository banking license in Wyoming to provide fiat and Bitcoin cryptocurrencies and digital assets. So they are falling on the heel heels of Kraken and the dominoes just continue to fall. So congratulations, Caitlin. Great job. She even states right here that this is a two and a half years culmination effort to get to to today. So again, there are no overnight successes. There are successes, but they take years to do. So congratulations, Caitlin, and to the Avanti team. So those are the big stories. Let's get into my pet project, voting. So I don't know where you are at watching this video. I don't know if you're in Europe or you're in Canada or in Mexico or United States, but 
just so you know, in the United States, we talk about voting a lot, but a lot of us don't do it. And this is a statistic that I've seen echoed throughout many a different uh, data analytics. And it talks about the percent turnout of how many people actually turn out to vote in the presidential elections. And usually it's about 50%, somewhere around there, 57, 55, something like that. And there's a lot of different barriers to voting here. I know like in Estonia, I've heard uh, great things that they are actually able to vote since 2005 online, which is great. So I am big into blockchain, DLT, cryptocurrency, digital assets. Obviously, I have this channel. And I always never understood why we could not vote online. So I reached out to the CEO of Votes, and I got him on the show, and I got a bunch of questions, and he's got a ton of answers. So let's jump right in. All right, everybody, welcome back to the office. So for a cue of the day, this is just a, a little pet project of mine. It doesn't come from a particular person, uh, but it's a question I've always had. Uh, if I can uh, open up a bank online, if I can find my soulmate online, if I can pay my taxes and do everything pretty much online, why can't I not vote online, especially uh, with blockchain uh, technology? So I, I reached out to uh, votes, V-O-A-T-Z dot com, and uh, the CEO, uh, Nimit Sahani, came on to answer some questions, which uh, I got to tell you, I think this is a, a fantastic reason to use blockchain. So Nimit, thanks so much for stopping by. Uh, let's start with, tell us about votes and who you're trying to actually target to help out to get people to vote right here in the US of A. Thank you. Thank you, Rob, for having us here. So votes is the youngest elections company in the country. We got started purely by accident a few years ago after winning a hackathon at South by Southwest. Mm. And since then, our focus has been to help voters who've traditionally been disenfranchised by the traditional voting process. So deployed military personnel, citizens who are living overseas, voters with disabilities, etc. And it's a mobile focus platform. So you have to download a smartphone application on your iPhone or Android device and then go through a strict vetting process. And only then do you get access to a ballot. Gotcha. So this is an online voting. It is through an app, correct? Okay. Yeah. So it is different from the traditional ways where people vote on a web browser. This requires you to have a smartphone app before an Android device. Great. So, so you are focusing on the disenfranchised or the people that can't get to the voting station. So uh, I pulled up this information. It's available on votes.com. I will link this in the description of the video. So disabilities, uh, soldiers who are deployed overseas, Native Americans, which I found was interesting because there was a, a little topic you talked about how it's difficult to get uh, voter registration or the documentation needed because they do not have um, traditionally accessible addresses. So I'm like, oh, it's pretty good. I'd like to hear that. Elderly voters, I think right now with COVID-19, it's important that they're not allowed around a ton of people. I got to tell you, I just voted yesterday and it was like this. It was a ton of people. In, in El Paso, we call it un bolo de gente. It's a ton of people concentrated and that's not good for elderly people or people who are immunocompromised. And then you talked about caregivers and people who are busy and then also uh, targeted by voter suppression. So talk about that real quick, targeted by voter suppression, because that's going to be a topic people are going to bring up. Absolutely. So we've seen a lot of news stories this year about certain groups of voters having to travel long distances to get to a polling station, not have easy access to, you know, postal draw boxes and things like that. And some of these same demographics have one of the highest smartphone penetrations in the country. And so um, they could really benefit from a remote voting technology, which, you know, follows all the, all the process, gets them verified. And so that's one of the areas we hope to focus on and, you know, help citizens who have once again challenges with the traditional voting process. Yeah. And I, so when I went to go vote, the line was very long. There was a ton of people right there. And, I'll, and all I'm thinking to myself is, look, I got my grandson at home. He is with my wife. She's going to need help. I need to go back home and do a couple of things for not just my YouTube channel, but for my other businesses. And that's just me. So I can only imagine how other people are in line, how much time do they actually have. And I think there was a statistic out that talked about uh, as far as U.S. citizens. I don't know how this is globally, but in the USA, uh, we're looking at around uh, half American citizens or 40% just do not vote at all. I think this is one of those reasons. 
just a topic. It is, and it is just really unfortunate that citizens have to wait. In some cases, we've seen you know for numerous hours just to get access to that ballot. I think that's something that needs to be changed and corrected. And one of the ways you can do it is by taking advantage of some of these new technologies. That's right. So let's break in, my man. Let's see what we got. So tell us how this all works. So if you go to votes.com, there is a nice little video. It's about a minute and a half or so. I'm not going to play it. I'm going to do the uh, faster version. So Nimit can, can uh, bring us through how this all works. So first of all, the very first step, this app that you have to download, first of all, how do you get the app? Uh, is there some kind of paperwork that you have to fill out or, or go to some place to actually get this app so you can download it to actually verify uh, and protect the voter identity, like it says here in step one? How does it all work? Sure. So it, it's, a, it's a very traditional uh, app registration voting process. It's the same as you would register to vote absentee for, you know, a postal ballot. Um, so you apply to your county clerk or your local election clerk. There's a standard form. There's also a federal form. And in that, you indicate your preference. So if you want to vote by mail, you check box. If you want by vote by uh, online option, you can choose this. Some jurisdictions will specifically say mobile. So then what happens is the jurisdiction does a little bit of vetting to make sure you're eligible. And then you g- receive an invitation to download the app on your iPhone or Android device. So you proceed with a mobile number and an email that needs to match the information you've already provided to the to the county or your local election clerk. And then the app will prompt you to take a picture of a government issued photo ID. So you can take, um, you can use a driver's license, state ID, or even a passport. You have to do front and back for the, for the license and, and the state ID. And then it prompts you to do a live video selfie. So you move your face, you know, blink your eyes. So it wants to know you're a real person, that you're not impersonating somebody. Uh, similarly, it checks your picture with the picture on your ID. And then it checks the data on your ID to make sure your ID is not expired and that data matches the voter registration system. Uh, and then the barcode and the holograms to make sure that it's not a fake document. So this typically takes for, for a large number of users less than a minute. If there's any discrepancy, then you might have to wait a little bit longer. Uh, and then once this process is completed, your identity is essentially tied to your mobile device and it's protected with the help of your biometric, which would be a fingerprint or a face ID or you know a wearable as well. And then all the documents you've provided are deleted for privacy purposes because we don't want to store them. We don't want to you know, increase the risk and they're never shared with anybody else. And at that point, you're kind of ready to receive your mobile ballot. And so you get a notification and then you can mark your ballot, and sign the affidavit on the screen and proceed. You get a receipt to verify your, your um, vote. And the jurisdiction also gets an anonymous receipt. And on election day, they're actually able to print out a paper ballot, which is what gets tabulated. And then there's a very comprehensive post-election audit process where any citizen can audit the election and make sure that everything turned out okay. Perfect. So we'll, we'll break those down in detail. But when I was going through the whole process yesterday to vote, I thought to myself, because I had to show them my ID, and they wrote it down. And there was a ton of people, and they were kind of rushing the whole process. And when you have so many people in the whole process, there is human error. So I thought to myself, you know, I remember having a fake ID when I was a kid so I can go drink, and it was fantastic, right? So I thought, well, I mean, couldn't you just, you know, make a real quick fake ID? Because, I mean, these guys aren't experts who are at the polling. They are just average citizens who have volunteered. So I think to myself, well, I mean, I could really do this. And if we're talking about, you know, voter fraud and things like that, how easy could it be, especially when everything's rushed? So that makes a lot of sense to me. So let's break it down again. Let me share my screen. Let's go over that, uh, this, these uh, steps. So you talked about this, the whole thing all the way through. Secures all submitted ballots. So when you put it in and, and it goes through the whole process, it is stored. Where is this stored? Where does this go to? So essentially what happens is the system uses um, distributed ledger technology, more commonly known as blockchain technology, and every oval you mark on the device, which essentially maps to every oval you would, if you were hand marking a paper ballot, gets stored as a transaction on the blockchain network. It's anonymized, so nobody can reverse engineer by looking at the blockchain data and say, this is you, Rob, or this is your vote. All they would know is this is for a specific election. 
and then anything beyond that they would not know only you would be able to audit audit your individual vote and as a citizen you can audit the entire election by looking at anonymous you know voter records anonymous receipts anonymous data on the blockchain but you'd never be able to go there and find out the of a voter and in addition the smartphone application also does a whole set of checks so it makes sure your device is secure um so if you have malware on it or if you mm-hmm. if you're running a unsafe wifi network it will actually stop you from voting and will you know take you through a cure process and once you fix those anomalies um then you'd be able to submit your ballot um so it does go over and beyond what traditional online systems have been able to do yeah so two things um when i cast my ballot that's it it went to the system it's in a black hole i can't check it afterwards i certainly i'm not going to be able to check this uh during this election that's for sure so you're telling me that i can go through and i can look at uh i can audit it on the blockchain kind of like how you can audit things on like etherscan you can take a look at all the transactions that were done for my ethereum wallet da 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 and you can say oh uh, here is my what uh you know code or here is my uh hex key so i can look at that and go okay that's my vote i definitely voted for uh, brock pierce for president or whoever it was and then i can come back and go okay this is this is good so that's the first thing the second thing is you talk about uh, dlt this distributed ledger technology and blockchain is this an open source is it decentralized or centralized more so like an ivm type of blockchain so <laughs> it is open source because it is using the hyperledger framework which was originally created by IBM and then open sourced and now the Linux foundation runs it and <clears throat> what we've done is we've created a very elections focused network so it is a public network but it's permissioned and the reason it's permissioned is um there are certain groups of entities who are permitted to interact with that that network anybody can see but to interact with it you either have to be an eligible voter so you'd have to have you know access to your mobile device or you have to be an auditor who can you know audit the election or or a node node operator and the reason we went that route instead of just using a fully permissionless network is because of the way elections are conducted in the US jurisdiction i mean blockchain by itself is is still very new when it com- comes to elections and explaining to officials that your bitcoin or ethereum node is potentially running in you know unfriendly parts of the world is is a very you know difficult conversation so early on we were Can based on the feedback advice that for legal constraints for policy constraints the network has to be governed in a jurisdiction where the elections happening they don't need to run the network so the government doesn't need to operate the nodes the nodes are you know run independently the government can participate and so it's uh, it's a hybrid model and i think it's it's kind of uh, one of the ways you can introduce this technology in a highly regulated space and over a period of time we may get to a state where it becomes completely permissionless but i i don't think that's where we could have begun so right now i can hear everybody groaning uh, on my <laughs> on my channel because that's that's usually how it goes and i was When I had done a little bit of research on it, I go, I think this is going to be based on IBM. I think it is going to be permission. I thought about it at first and I'm like, ah, it's kind of a bummer. But then I really I realized one thing, and that is we have to start somewhere, Nimit. And what you just said was correct. To get this to actually get off the ground, to have this done from a permissionless, uh, you know, totally de- decentralized would be very tough to do, and we'd be looking at another 10 years. So why don't we fight this revolution from the inside instead of going from the outside in? I think it's it's a great start. I think we all know where we want it to be. It's just that is what it is. So, I will just say this. If I could use it right now and vote, it's way better than what we have right now. And I will go for that all day long. So, let me know what you think in the comment section and I can hear it. But uh let's move on. So, let me share my screen again. Let's go back. And so we got this. You explained that perfectly. Uh There was a question when you said that you can have since it's permission and you have the auditors there can they change anything and if they do change anything just to verify uh there is a record of all changes correct 
So the auditor cannot change anything. The auditor's role is to view because if you allow changes, then it creates a whole set of complications here. I mean, by definition, the the network is tamper resistant, right? And so you can only append, which means you can add new stuff. You cannot change anything. If there is a malicious entity and they try to change something, they will get kicked out of the it will be it's it would be really really hard like everybody in the net could have to you know collude and ignore a change so it's it's practically close to impossible to do uh and that's that's useful from an elections perspective and i'll give you a good example um there are jurisdictions which allow people to vote multiple times and only the last vote counts so a good example is estonia and it's a very useful um feature because one of the concerns a lot of the skeptics have about remote voting online voting is that because you're voting in a private space maybe there's there's a risk to coercion or being forced to vote a certain way for some people right for other people it's safer so you you could go either way but in that scenario what the government of estonia does is lets you vote as many times as you want and so if, if you voted once under duress, you can come back and vote in the evening or the other day. And only your last vote will count. And so if you do that on a, on a, on a blockchain-based network, you would have a record of all those attempts and only the last one will count. And I think for transparency purposes, that's how you want it. You don't want a previous attempt to get overwritten. Um, so we, we, we like that approach. In the U.S., very few jurisdictions actually allow you to change your absentee vote. Um, some do. And the process there is <clears throat> you have to give up your anonymity. So when you vote once, you get a receipt. The receipt has an anonymous ID. And let's say for, for any reason uh, you made a mistake and you want to change your vote and your jurisdiction allows you to, then you have to approach the jurisdiction, provide this ID, they then go dig up the receipt and basically then at that point they know how you voted. So you've given up your anonymity, but the, then you get a second, second attempt and then you can vote again and only your second attempt would count. But most jurisdictions don't allow that. And a, a blockchain based network actually helps that because you would have a record of all the attempts and you can make sure only the last one counts. Yeah. And then I, when you said that, to me personally, that's I'm not a fan of that whatsoever. I mean, in, in Estonia, somebody from Estonia or either they are a family there, they said, hey, we've been we've been voting since 2005 and we don't know why it can't come over here. And I was like, well, I don't know. I, gotta, I can ask them at this. So one of those. So to actually vote again and again and again, seems like sounds like a nightmare. Now, if you're talking about voter coercion and this is one of the things that we're going to talk about. Uh, this is in. A little document uh, of election fraud and one of those things was talking about voter coercion so you can either get voter coercion at the polls potentially or you can get voter coercion at home nothing is going to be safe and uh, nothing's going to be perfect so we i guess kind of take the good and the bad and hopefully uh you know we have a less of a percentage at home you know maybe uh <laughs> the yeah. the wife is bullying the husband vote this part this way who knows i don't know yeah the technology does not have a perfect solution to, to coercion, but you can, you know, mitigate policy and through best practices and obviously legal measures. Um, and so, yeah, it cuts both ways. There are people who would feel safer voting at home and there are people who would feel safer voting in a polling location. So you have to cater to both scenarios. Yeah. I think this comes down to a point that a subscriber made and, and I kind of jumping all over the place and I apologize, but he did say, he goes, if we have this, technology and we're able to do this, then maybe a politician will say, hey, this isn't fair for the disenfranchised, uh, the poor and the downtrodden because they can't afford uh, smartphones. So um, I guess if you have it that way, I mean, does it really make a difference? To me personally, I think it, it frees up a lot of the congestion at the polls. So if you have, let's say you have just 25% just of people that vote uh, using this app, well, that's 25% of people that aren't mine and we can get into the polls and we can get things done and off we go. That's just my, my thinking. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think the, the really important thing to note is nobody is going to be forced using a smartphone. Like it's all about voter choice. 
So let's give voters as many choices as, as they want. If you want to go vote in person and it's safe for you to do so, please, you should have that option. If it's safe for you to do so uh, in your jurisdiction to vote by mail, you should have that option. And similarly, you, if, if you are eligible, you should have an option to vote on your smartphone as well and let the voter choose and people will make the best choice for themselves. And so that way you're not forcing anybody to use a certain method or a certain technology. Absolutely. That's the truth. Okay. So moving on, I think we talked about this. I thought it was a fantastic uh, idea about uh, biometrics, your thumb, your uh, face, your um, kind of like KYC AML type of thing where they actually take a picture of your government ID. I mean, in the crypto space, we're already doing that anyhow. Uh, well, most of us, not all of us. So uh, we would be uh, well versed in this one. So it makes sense. And then, so you submit the vote, it goes over. We know how that works out. And then, of course, we talked about the audits and it's on the blockchain, IBM permissioned. We'll work on that later. Sure. Okay. Off we go. And a really important thing to note here is for a U.S. elections case, the middle case, it's actually generating a paper ballot um, because that's how our traditional process works, right? When you vote in person, you vote by mail. It's the paper ballot which gets counted. There's no kind of, you know, other tally. And so to kind of smoothly integrate with that legacy system, this system also generates a paper ballot. And so there's no digital tabulation until that paper ballot is scanned and tabulated, just as if you had voted in person. So that's really important to note because it's another point of auditing. You have the voter receipt, you have the printed paper ballot, and then you have the data on the blockchain. And so there are multiple points to check and audit the system. Yeah, I hope it would at some point go to off of that paper and just do everything on the blockchain, but who knows? Um, I think it's, and one thing I, I want to make mention again, I said this before and I'll say it again. What I think is great about this is to be able to not only vote, but then check your vote on the blockchain and go, okay, who did I vote for? There's the person, there's all the people, and it's all right there. So you can do it right after you vote, during the election, and then right after the election. Because right now, when I just voted, uh, I have no idea where it goes. Uh, and I hope that it gets to the right people, and that's the big thing. Okay. So Nimit, thanks. And then talk to us about this. This was smartphone app voting versus web browser. And we've talked a lot about these things, but just uh, we'll rush through this or we'll, we'll go with this and uh, tell me what your thoughts are. So secure enclave. So as, as, as most of us are aware, people have been tried to, trying to do online voting for the last you know, 15 plus years. And no, none of the attempts have really gone mainstream, primarily because of certain key security concerns. What has changed in the last few years is the advancement of certain technologies. One of them is smartphone hardware. So our smartphones now come with, you know, what's, what's called as secure elements. These are like you know, secure hardware processors, which, you know, are able to secure our digital keys, our cryptographic information. And that's a game changer because that's not available to a web browser on most computers. And so <clears throat> that enables, you know, a whole new set of security paradigms to be um, tapped into, which a smartphone app can do, but a browser app cannot currently do. Similarly, being, ability, uh, being able to remotely proof a voter, as, as you saw, you're familiar with the whole KYC process. Mm -hmm. um, and then <clears throat> the other really big challenge being if you if you do something on a web browser there's no way for a remote application to authoritatively detect is your computer safe is your browser compromised are you running a trojan mm -hmm. on a smartphone app <clears throat> that has changed as well in the last few years we are now able to detect if your device is compromised if you have malware if you have a suspicious app running or if you're on an unsafe wi-fi network somebody's trying to do a man in the middle attack so all those things you know make it really really kind of a game changer type of situation similarly the use of distributed ledgers where you no longer have to store data in a you know sql type database you can use tamper resistant stores so even even the operator of the system can no longer change the data and then the whole idea of providing voters receipts which they can use audit you know use that for an audit purpose that's also very unique to this system and that enables every citizen to build trust and transparency into the process without really revealing how you voted and then another really um, really important thing to note is voters with disabilities there are voters who can hand mark a paper ballot 
who can't you know use a standard browser application but with the great improvements both apple google samsung have done on you know mobile devices now they can use an accessibility feature we recently had a blind voter who voted you know touch free hands free another voter with a motor disability voted with double triple taps so you are now enabling citizens who would otherwise not vote or somebody else had to vote for them giving them that ability and it ensures if you want the ability to you know prove that only one person can vote on one device in some cases and so that's overall some of the kind of key advantage of using um, a smartphone app based system over a traditional browser based system got it so you covered everything i think i that last one was uh, the big one to me one device one vote and uh, this was the big question for a lot of my subscribers so that is the whole thing one device one vote not like estonia they can vote 20 times whatever else so i'm good with that okay so this is how it all works sounds fantastic let's get into the negatives so talk to us about this one so this was it was a uh, article in abc news or nbc news vote smartphone voting app has significant security flaws MIT researchers say, and I'm just going to sum it all up uh, like this. So this was February 13th, 2020. Recent version of smartphone voting app has been used in limited capacity in federal elections across four states. We'll talk about it in a bit. Researchers, no, excuse me. Uh, researchers have found significant security flaws. A Massachusetts Institute of Technology or MIT study has found. Researchers did not say they found evidence that the app has been hacked, but they said the vulnerabilities could have been exploited. And they state, we find that Votes has vulnerabilities that allow different kind of adversaries to alter, stop, or expose a user's vote. So this is what's going on. So talk to us about what exactly happened. Because when I read into this in another article, it talked about how they had used an older version of your app, and there was issues there. But then there was something else. So Nimit, tell us what's going on here. Absolutely. And so I would I would start by saying that criticism of you know any attempt to do online or internet based voting is not new, right? It's it's been around for the last you know, better part of two decades. In this scenario, the the attempt was to use an older version of of our Android application. They were not able to get into the system. They were not able to do any kind of transaction or you know do a vote, and so they only had access to a very small piece of the infrastructure that was also outdated. And <clears throat> they proceeded to make a whole set of assumptions, which were theoretical, without actually knowing how the rest of the system worked. And <clears throat> we focus on kind of the practical side of the security. Um, theoretically. We all know no system is 100% safe. That's true of our in-person voting system, you know, our other, other systems. But through a set of controls and procedures to detect and, and mitigate, you can make a system safe enough. And so in the field, we've never had anybody show us that they're able to compromise a vote. We've actually um, run elections recently this year where which were actually attacked and 100 percent of attempts to attack the system were, were blocked and caught and mitigated and so <clears throat> i think the the research uh, side of it is useful but we also need to focus on the practical side of security because sometimes that varies very significantly from the theory uh, we we appreciate the interest but I think our focus is more on how to practically secure the system. And we've been very successful. We've done 70 elections and every election has been successful. Every oval has come out okay in, in the audits. So we feel good about it, but we're constantly improving and trying to make the system better, secure, stay ahead of the adversaries. And so it's, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a work in progress all the time. Sure. Look, small business owner, nothing's perfect, right? We, we, we aim for excellence uh, and we try to get there as much as possible. And then along the way, we have some hiccups. Sure. So another thing is that uh, I think, did you reach out to them afterwards and say, hey, this is what happened. You use an older version. You didn't have access to all the data. We'd like you to come back in and, and do this again, set the record straight. <clears throat> we did. We, we even uh, offered that I mean, at the time when the report was published, we they chose to stay anonymous. But prior to that, uh, we had approached them on social media, invited them. They did not accept. 
and then even after the report was published we have uh, we have tried to collaborate we actually have a public bug bounty system we were the first elections company to launch a bug bounty system so any researcher can get access to our you know system there's a replica test system you can get a test android app test apple app and you can you know do the full vote do the full verification and give us you know feedback help us you know make the system better and so that's available sure. we encourage every researcher out there to use it um, but so far um, you know the folks who wrote the report haven't haven't shown an interest in doing that i have to tell you um, one of the one of the big things that the subscribers have asked is do you really think that politicians and the powers that be are going to let this actually happen because to get voting in the hands of everybody uh, that's a pretty powerful proposition. So there would probably be a little bit of a pushback from some people and maybe an incentive to uh, not have this happen. I'm not saying that's what it is. But in the cryptocurrency world, we know we call this FUD, fear, uncertainty, doubt. And it spreads and it's much easier to spread FUD than to fix a problem. That's all I'm going to say about that. That's absolutely. I totally agree. I mean, we, we look at all the attempts that have been made to stop Internet voting in the last couple of decades. I feel like if only a fraction of that effort had been made to, you know, actually build the technology, we would probably have had a national online voting system by now. And you know, <laughs> with the year of a pandemic, it could have helped a lot of people. Um, I mean, just like we went to the moon, it was, you know, there was a national effort. Um, I think this is this is one of those things where um, sometimes the criticism, the amount of effort spent in the criticism. Is, is strange when you could spend a fraction of that and actually make make something which benefits uh, everybody. You're preaching to the choir, Nimit. You're preaching to the choir. So just to, just to continue on with this article, this was interesting to me. It says, while the app has undergone several private independent security audits, the results have never been made public, which I thought was odd because before I came in here, I did a little research myself. I looked in your FAQ section, audits and testing, which will bring us to all the different audits that have been done. You can click on those and you can see the actual audits that have been done by different organizations. This is one from uh, Utah Republican Party. I think it's in, I think I want to say page 10 or page 9, where it talks about, where did we go? Ba, ba, ba. Audit overview. Uh, Cybersecurity Center worked with the Utah GOP party to recruit poll workers to assist with the poll. Audit remain open. The audit for this political convention includes viewing the ballot receipts generated for each voter. This enables auditors to confirm. One audit reviewed 140 ballots, 48 ballots, and so on and so forth. Key findings. Uh, we do not find any issues with the audit that would lead to concern that there was any internal or external tampering of the results. And here's another one that I found. Again, on your website, talk about uh, it was the Denver uh, mobile voting pilot. The same type of thing. Found no, no issues. And then this was from the Department of Homeland Security. This was a uh, summary that you guys have put out, and this is what they found. There were some issues, and then you talked about how you would correct them, and it's all right here. So yeah, interesting stuff. I think it is put out there. It just you have to do a little bit of uh, uh, research on your own end and then go that route. So makes sense. Let's get into this part here. So I think you answered all our questions so far, but this is what I had a question about, which was what exactly is voter fraud and voter tampering and everything else, and what are the problems with uh, voting in general? So. This was a report that was put out just uh, about a year ago or so, and it just talks about the different types of voter fraud. First one, impersonation fraud of the polls, like we just talked about. And Nimit, you said exactly how we could get away from this, right? Biometrics, verification of your ID, video chat or video conference or, or video uh, recording of you and your eyes and everything else. So it makes sense. False registrations, either a phony name a real or fake address, or a claim residence in a particular jurisdiction where the registered voter does not actually live and is unentitled to vote. How do we fix that? Is that an issue? So there, there have been uh, significant attempts to help with this. Um, there's actually a, a multi-state initiative called ERIC, and uh, um, I'd say at least 30 states now are participating in that. And what that requires is the different states and basically their state registration systems to share data and if every state starts to do this then you can eliminate this kind of um, uh, misuse where somebody you know registers in one jurisdiction and then you know maybe has a residence in another jurisdiction and tries to 
go do the same thing over there. And through this sharing mechanism in a you know secure secure manner, you can uh, eliminate that risk. So there there are attempts to do that. It's not nationwide yet, uh, but I would encourage people to look at Eric is one such project where multiple states are participating, and it's it's one of the good ways uh, things uh, things are improving. Nimit, how easy? Not how easy. Yeah, how easy could you do it? Let's say that someone came to you and go, Nimit would want you to do nationwide. And we want the votes app and we want to use it all the way through. First of all, it's a lot of work. Let's just be honest. But how easy would it be to weed out different people, especially if it's connected to your social security number, your ID, your address and everything else for someone to go, no, I'm going to vote in Florida. No, 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 I'm going to vote in Texas. And you got two different people in two different areas, but you have all their information, especially, you know, uh, with you guys, how easy would it be just to say, no, no, you can't do that. Yeah. So one of the challenges in the U S is, um, because elections are not really conducted in government. It's all the states. So it's all happening. At, and we also don't have a formal national ID, so to speak, which is one of the differences in most of the countries where you have some form of a national ID. So here uh, we have to default to state-level documents, which is you know the driver's license or a state ID. And people have passports, but only a third of the country has passports. So you can't really use a passport universally as well. And so what that does is it requires logical segregation of, you know, election setups at the state level and in many cases at the county and the local level. And so the the scenario you described, essentially you would have to register to be an eligible voter in more than one jurisdiction. And then as soon as you register in one jurisdiction, when you try to register jurisdiction because that data sharing is happening that would block that attempt and so having that kind of a uniformity in terms of you know synchronization of the voter registration would prevent that from sure. you know yeah and actually as i was saying it, i was listening to your answer i was like i can hear people right now going there is no way i'm going to give all my information to big brother to, to watch and monitor me so <laughs> i get that one all right so, yeah that's a fair point and i think that since privacy is key here, even though you are scanning your ID, you're taking a picture, you're revealing, you know, personally identifiable information, but we actually delete that. We are not storing your ID. We're not storing your picture perpetually. It's only used to verify you. And then once you're verified and tied to your device, we no longer need it unless you delete the app or you go to a new phone or, you know, you change your address or things like that. And so I think that um, the, the model there is very privacy focused. This data is not shared with anybody. It's not used for any kind of marketing purpose. And so we, we definitely need to find that fine balance where we verify the voters, but at the same time, ensure that the privacy and concerns are not violated at all. Yeah. I, you know what? Start statewide, go from there. Probably just statewide. Uh, I, I'm not going to delve into that anymore. So Thank you for that one. So then we, we talked about duplicate voting. You know, that's, that's, we can't do that, uh, especially with this system. This is a big one, absentee balance, fraudulent use of absentee ballots. Well, this would totally eliminate that issue if we can have somebody, uh, when they register, they use biometrics, face ID, their actual ID, as opposed to just mailing it to somebody's house, whoever fills it out, fills it out, and then returns it. Absolutely. Yeah, this would definitely help against that. and also. Um, kind of, you know, prevent people from trying to vote more, more than once because once you've requested an absentee ballot, the kind of flag gets marked on the state system. You try to show up in person on election day and try to vote again, not issue a ballot because you've already technically voted. And so, yeah, that definitely would help prevent um, a lot of the, the fraud which uh, is possible in the normal absentee voting scenario yeah i'll get to buying votes last but illegal assistance at the polls we talked about that sometimes people want to do it over there they want to do it in the home but there is voter uh coercion we could say ineligible voting well this wouldn't happen because you know we have to do all the different steps altering the vote count we talked about that because of everything's on the blockchain you can verify it and especially if this is what i think if you are an average citizen and you would you say well you can wait in line for two hours or you can double check your vote later uh, there is one extra step. Just double check your vote later. I'm going to save you a bunch of time. So go with that. And then the ballot petition fraud, 
uh, which is forging the signatures, we can't do that. The only thing that I can say is buying votes. I don't know how you would get around this because if you're going to buy a vote, you're going to buy a vote and that's that. At risk exists in our current system as well, right? If some, you know, force somebody that way, that risk is there as well. This uh, technology cannot eliminate the the risk of that or no risk of coercion completely. It can provide some mitigations, but I think that problem is solved through policy, through voter education, through you know legal methods. Um, so I, that's that's one of the things technology cannot solve completely. Of course. Okay, and then last to finish up because we're going a little bit long. I apologize. Uh, this was just uh, from all the subscribers, and I asked them, you know, what would you want to hear about? So, so we talked about how are the votes secure because it's on the blockchain, right? How are your platform hack proof? Nothing's hack proof right now. Uh, we're doing, uh, we're we're getting to that point. But like you said, how many different uh, elections have you done so far? Did you say seventeen or seven B? So we have seventy successful elections so far. Uh, out. 11 have been government elections. So our first government election was in 2018 with the state of West Virginia in their state primary, two counties. Uh, and since then, um, you know, we've continued to do that. We also work with political parties, do their internal elections and convention voting in several states. So there is some element of uh, bipartisan support. And in the presidential election right now, uh, system is being used by uh, counties uh, in a couple of states um, for in a small measure it's focused voters citizens overseas um, voters with disabilities as well awesome okay and then that's pretty much across the board the same type of thing we had over uh, 50 votes here but over I think we had almost about 500 there and then questions let's see if we answered them this was from John I gotta tell you I would support this as an option, uh, but how many years throw before the general public would adopt it as they would probably be suspicious of not being able to stay anonymous and have no idea about blockchain. So we talked about that, you know, about the anonymity. You don't store any information. The big thing that I think would really help is education. And that's why we're here, right? To, to, real, to teach people that if there is an, un, there's anonymousness for this, it is on the blockchain. It is a uh, distributed ledger technology. Eh. Right now it's centralized, maybe we'll decentralize later. And he says also certain uh, politicians would say it would disadvantage the poor because not everyone has access, uh, which is a lie, the internet. And then, which is a great point, but you had talked about something about smartphones. So the disenfranchised in the United States, below poverty level or yeah. at poverty level, what is the percentage of people who have smartphones? Yeah, there's there's an interesting uh, statistic. It, uh, there's a there's a link to the study on our website as well. So some of the most traditionally disenfranchised communities, folks who have to you know walk the longest to get to a polling station or you know don't have access to the postal mailboxes, actually have the highest some of the highest smartphone penetration, and so it's it's um, it's close to ninety percent, and so I I think there is an opportunity here to use technology to bring access to people who don't have access with the traditional traditional methods and that's happening in several other parts of the world and you know the smartphone has kind of revolutionized that aspect so definitely <clears throat> it's um, something to keep in mind and just to add to the the other aspect about the anonymity we, we should remember that Every oval you mark is stored on the blockchain, but your identity isn't. So there's no real, no way for anybody to reverse engineer and say that vote. So that's also uh, something really important to keep in mind. Perfect. And then this one we kind of answered, and I just want to reiterate. So this is from Novo. He said, this is the ideal solution, but the question is, why would political parties be in favor of getting rid of voter fraud when it helps them? And uh, <laughs> that's why I'm glad Nimit is doing this, because I don't want to do that. Uh, he's got an up, uphill battle ahead of him, and uh, good luck to you. Godspeed, soldier. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for having us here. Yeah, and then uh, are they going to support anonymity? We answered that. And then uh, this is from Genetics. He just talks about how they're going to commit voter fraud or how we're going to deal with uh, this is for absentee ballots, you know, sending out to dead people, people in the household filling it out. And we just talked about how that works. So uh, this one a little bit long, but it's one of my pet pet projects I like to talk about as far as voting. And I just want to say thanks, Nimit, for coming on to the, onto the show. I really appreciate it. Hopefully in the future, this will be the next big thing. 
uh, just going to be a little bit wild for everybody to catch on. Just like Bitcoin, cryptocurrency, digital assets, just going to take a while in education. Oh, absolutely. I think it'll take a, take a little bit of yeah, piloting this very slowly and thoughtfully. Um, hopefully in a few years, people will have access to it. So thank you. <laughs> All right. Thanks so much. And that's it. Let's jump back. So look, that's it. Thanks for sticking with me through the whole video. I know it was long. And I, again, it's not a very sexy topic per se. You can't invest a ton of money into it, make a ton of money. But it is one of those projects that could change everything. So thanks again for watching it. Uh, one of my pet projects. And if you like these types of videos, uh, more so on the news side, there's going to be two more that's going to pop up on your left and right. I'll let YouTube do their magic. That is it for today. Thanks so much. See you on the next one.